Chapter 8. This week is about conceptualization and operationalization when conducting a research project. In this chapter, we will talk about the process of forming conceptualizations and operationalizing these conceptions for both quantitative and qualitative research processes. Slide two. Briefly, we'll discuss conceptual explication, operational definitions, operational choices, the use of existing scales, and finally, the qualitative perspective to conceptualization slash operationalization. Slide three. Particularly when we are doing quantitative research, we want to be explicit about the concepts we are using. The text refers to this as conceptual explication. It simply means that we want to fully understand the important concepts in our research study. A concept is a mental image that symbolizes an idea or an object, some event or behavior, or a person, place, or thing, etc. Concepts can be very simple, or they can be quite complex. A concept such as post-traumatic stress disorder or attachment disorder can be extremely complex and consist of many subconcepts. When thinking about PTSD, or better yet, if you have a copy of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, you will find these concepts spelled out quite clearly. <coughs> The person has to have experienced a qualifying event, which is different depending on the, if the person is an adult or a child at the time of the qualifying event. These qualifying events are concepts that they themselves have several attributes. Further, with PTSD, you will see a concept related to mood dysregulation. And again, it will have multiple sub-concepts or attributes. In the slide, we see the attributes of male and female being the sub-concept of the concept gender. At times, it seems like a lot of overthinking, particularly with something as simple as gender. However, it is not that simple. Depending on what you are studying, you may have gender concepts that include attributes beyond male and female. Slide 4. Developing a proper hypothesis. We think about hypothesis. We are usually thinking about quantitative research. When it comes to research hypotheses, there is not a strict convention that all researchers follow when stating their hypotheses. Basically, a hypothesis consists of one or more independent variables and one and sometimes more dependent variables. Sometimes researchers will simplify the word for independent with the word predictor. I mean substitute the word independent for the word predictor. When you're doing research or when you are evaluating your own practice, typically the independent variable is the thing that you are doing. For example, DBT therapy, job training, eight weeks of 12-step facilitated therapy, etc. Those are all independent or predictor variables. Things that you do that will predict an outcome. Now the dependent variable is simply the thing being predicted. Or when you're evaluating your own practice, it is the outcome of interest. Sometimes when doing research, the independent variable will be something that you are not doing. Let's say, for example, you want to see if there is a difference in outcomes within your case management program based on the race or gender of the participant. Even 
though their race or ethnicity or their gender is not something that you did or manipulated, it's not your intervention. But it is the thing that you are speculating will predict a difference on the outcome or dependent variable. A good hypothesis is clear and specific. If you ever create a hypothesis that includes the word and, you might want to see if you can't simplify the hypothesis or split it into separate hypotheses. Slide 5. In this slide, we can see that there is a subtle difference between descriptive research and explanatory research. So we have a broad research question on the left. What is the extent and nature of the substance abuse problems in the town, especially among those for whom English is not their main language? If the purpose of the study is simply to describe that phenomenon, we don't have a hypothesis, which doesn't mean that we won't be comparing variables on some outcome variable. We will be looking clearly at those for whom English is their main language and those for whom it is not, and among those for whom it is not, we may be looking at a variety of different languages, for example, Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, German, etc. Whatever it is that we have in our lo locale. However, if our study is explanatory in nature, meaning that we have some theory that tells us something will be one way or another, then we will state our hypothesis accordingly. Say we are looking at just drinking and the rates of drinking, whether or not someone drinks or not, foregoing the question of abuse for the moment. We would form a hypothesis that says for those for whom English is their main language, will drink at higher rates than those who have some other language as their main language. We may also have a competing hypothesis, which is just the opposite. <clears throat> we may also have a null hypothesis, which simply states that there is no difference. Slide 6. In this slide, and in the following slide, we will talk about other types of variables that may be of interest to our study. Sometimes, these are sometimes called extraneous variables, sometimes are called control variables, but they are variables that are put into place to see if an observed relationship is misleading in some way. They represent alternative explanations for relationships that are observed between independent and dependent variables. For example, some years ago I was doing a lot of literature review on the subject of American Indians and diabetes. There were a lot of studies out there at the time that showed this very strong relationship between race and particularly being American Indian and the manifestation of diabetes. Sometimes control variables would be used, such as the level of acculturation to a Western diet or being multiracial, but rarely did I see studies that included income. Looking at those studies and comparing them to studies that looked at income alone, it became clear that the control <coughs> variable of income had the potential to dismiss the power of being American Indian as a predictor of diabetes. So that extraneous variable of income represents an alternative explanation of what's going on between the independent variable, in this case being American Indian, and the dependent variable, or in this case having diabetes. Being cognizant of extraneous variables is very important for social workers as the social milieu is that we do our treatment in is often quite complex. Furthermore, many times our treatment modalities themselves are quite complex. As much as possible, when we understand all the dynamics of what is going on in a research project or in a social work intervention, that 
we are evaluating, the more we will be able to strongly determine what, whether or not our project is doing what we claim it to be doing. Slide 7. Sometimes there are things within the social environment or within individuals themselves that mediate or come between our intervention, the independent variable, and the outcome or dependent variable. Sometimes you will see mediating variables called intervening variables in some studies. The moderating variable is something that can affect the direction of the relationship between the independent and dependent variable. We'll look at a couple of these in the next slide. When mediating and moderating variables get in the way of our understanding, it is said to cause a spurious causal relationship. Spurious causal relationships is one of those terms that is important to remember when reading research, especially when reading criticisms of research. Many times authors will surely say the relationship is spurious and not go into great detail. detail. <clears throat> Whether trying to say something is going on or they believe something is going on when other than the independent variable that is causing the change in the dependent variable. In the example in this slide, we can see that two variables, the amount of social services provided to patient and family, either more or less, and the patient death rate higher and lower. And when we run analysis on the type of intervention, we will often find that patients who receive more social services die at a higher rate than those who receive less. But obviously, we don't want to believe that our social work interventions are causing people to die. Something else must be going on. Slide 9. When we look at this slide, we can see that by adding another variable to our research equation, in this case, whether or not the severity of the illness is terminal or not terminal, and we can see that people who are terminal in their illness and are receiving more social services and are having a higher death rate. Both of these things are happening because they have a terminal illness. Those who are not terminal receive less social service on average because they don't have a terminal illness. They also have a lower death rate. Slide 10. When we describe relationships between independent and dependent variables, we tend to, to be positive or negative. However, sometimes we want to look to see if a relationship could be curvilinear. Slide 11. Next semester, when we get into quantitative statistics, we will chart the relationship between dependent and independent variables. In this slide, we see three examples of linear relationships. Many times, journals will simply say that there was a positive relationship between the level of drinking and legal difficulties, for example, meaning the more one drinks, the more one gets into legal difficulties. As one goes up, the other goes up. In this example, the level of fit between the client's reason for coming to treatment and the service goal formulated by the practitioner positively relates to the level of client satisfaction. When we have a negative relationship, what that means is that one variable goes up, the other goes down. In the second image in the slide, it is measuring the level of family income to the level of family stress. And as family income goes up, family stress becomes lower, or vice versa. It could be said to be true. Typically, charts that examine the linear relationship between variables 
or red from left to right. When there is a line that slopes upward from left to right, the relationship is positive. And when it slopes from left to right going down, that means that there is a negative relationship. Box number three is a curvilinear relationship. Skepticism decreases as students take more research courses, but only up to a point. After that, skepticism begins to increase again. Not wanting to malign taking research courses, I would rather use the example of drinking red wine. There was a lot of media attention to some research that indicated that drinking red wine was good for your heart. And that is a perfect example of a curvilinear relationship. As drinking red wine went up from zero to two or three, somewhere in that range, we saw the level of heart disease decrease. However, if you went beyond two or three drinks a day, you would find that heart disease starts to go up again. Slide 12. When doing quantitative research especially, when we're doing survey research, we want to carefully define what we mean by independent and dependent variables and translate those into terms those terms into something that is observable. Because if we choose a definition for a variable that does not actually define the variable, our research findings can be influenced or invalidated. Slide 13. Conceptualization is an important part of research in both the reporting of the study, letting other people know what you mean by certain terms, but also it is important in the conduct of the research. To let you, the researcher, know what you mean by a certain concept that when you are using it. If you are not clear about the conceptualization, you won't be able to create a clear and accurate operationalization of it. Slide 14. It is important to think about indicators and dimensions especially when we are creating scales to measure concepts that are not easily observed. For example, compassion is not something that you can put on a scale and measure, but it is something that most of us know when we see. So we take a concept like compassion and start to define its indicators. For example, visiting children in the hospital, being kind to puppies, helping people across the street when they are elderly or infirm. Whereas a dimension is better thought of as a facet or a concept like economic dimension of social justice or a civil rights dimension of social justice. You might have the concept of discrimination that has a dimension of race discrimination, gender discrimination or ethnic or country of origin discrimination. These would all be considered dimensions of discrimination. Slide 15. Clarifying concepts is an important and ongoing part of any research process. The bulk of the clarification in quantitative research happens before the survey is shipped out the door and implemented where in the case of qualitative research, oftentimes clarifying concepts is something that goes on throughout the research process, even through the report writing and publishing process and beyond. Slide 16. When we create conceptual order, <clears throat> we can be well served if we will work it out <clears throat> graph it out, such as the case in this slide, where we see conceptualization leads to nominal definition, which leads to operational, which leads to measurements that we can take in the real world. Say, for example, we want to understand why people discriminate against those who are gay and lesbian. In the process of our literature review, we begin to form a concept that we call homophobia. 
When we have named the concept, we have given it a nominal definition. Then we need to operationalize it. What are those things that go into homophobia? Could be wanting to avoid gay or lesbian people. Could be wanting to cause barriers to equal access for lesbian and gay people. It could be experiencing of distressing feelings when thinking about gay or lesbian people or when watching romantic scenes in movies that contains homosexual love. All those things we can measure. We can ask about people's actions. We can ask about their feelings or their responses to certain indicators. We can hook up measurement devices to people. We could measure reaction times, etc. Slide 17. Harkening back to the earlier chapter on cultural competence, we have to remember that it is easy to be self-referent in our operational definitions. In the text, the authors use the example of wife abuse, which used to be called around here wife battering, which carries with it the assumption that it is only the wife, i.e. female, that gets battered. It also carries with it the assumption that it only matters or happens within the context of a relationship where one is considered to be a wife. To become more gender neutral and to encompass various relationship styles, it became operationalized as domestic violence, which implies that it only happens within domestic relationships. What about casual dating relationships? There's usually not a right or a wrong answer to any of this stuff, but it is important where you draw your lines and that you make them clear as to what you mean. You can't assume that somebody is going to know what you mean when you ask the question, have you ever experienced intimate partner violence? <clears throat> Input what you mean by intimate partner violence. What do they mean by intimate partner violence? Sexual intimacy? Emotional intimacy, spatial intimacy, relational intimacy, and violence. There are kinds of violence and levels of violence that mean different things to different people. The complexity of all this stuff is not meant to dishearten you. And when you stop and think about it, the better you become at being operational definer in the research, the better you will be able to do clinical social work practice because you will begin to Think of those types of questions that bring you bring with it a clear understanding of the client's world. If you were talking about intimate partner and violence in a therapeutic relationship, you would want to know those specific details about kinds and types of intimacy, kinds and types of violence, etc. 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 Slide eighteen. When operationalizing something, it is important to consider its naturally existing range of variation. Continuing on with the example from the previous slide, violence is a very gross category. It can range from murder and torture to social slights and offensive joking, depending on the perpetrator and the recipient of the violence. Slide 19. When conducting your own research project, it can save you a lot of time and effort and sometimes a lot of money if you simply use someone else's scale. Why go to the effort of devising a depression scale when you can use Beck's Depression Inventory, a scale which has been used for many years and has been validated with many, if not all, populations? Slide 20. When thinking about conducting qualitative research, unlike quantitative research, we don't restrict ourselves to a set of predetermined indicators. Oftentimes, qualitative research is conducted on little or difficult to understand concepts or with populations with whom it may be difficult to do generalize because of a high degree of diversity. 21. As you can see, there are problems with operational definitions, some of which 
simply cannot be overcome, that should not be used as an excuse for not defining variables as well as we can. And it should remind us to be ever mindful to an emerging understanding of operational definitions as we continue in the research process. That's the end.